Hello, I'm Brian Nielsen, owner and horologist for Pocket Full of Time. So you've just inherited Great Grandmother McCance's mantle clock. What are you going to do with it? Should you get it back up in running condition? Should it be restored? What can be done? Or you've bought one from a estate sale, or from an antique shop, or from eBay, and you want to get it in running condition. Is it worth having it done? Is it worth uh, going through the trouble? Most of the time, the answer is yes. Even the worst looking clock with the most uh, uh, dirtiest movement is not really that much more than a regular full service on a clock. What we're going to show you today is what happens when you take your clock into a shop and get a full service and restore one of these hundred year old timepieces back to the glory that they had when they came out of the factory so many years ago. Let's take a closer look, shall we? What this video is going to show you is what happens to your clock in a reputable clock shop, mine or any other reputable clock shop, that uh, takes your clock and does what's called a full service. Meeting. Okay, now first thing you got to do is take uh, the hands. I'm going to show you for for you hobbyists and you for you uh, aspiring horologists out there uh, some of the tools and some of the tools that I use I've, I've made. This is uh, how I uh, remove and install taper pins. I took a pair of uh, needle nose pliers and if you see real close there's a slot on that side and there's not a slot on that side and they've been blunted down. And this is how uh, I remove very safely um, um, uh, taper pins on these clocks. Okay, this is just a regular piece of uh, photo paper. Uh, it, it's a heavy type paper. It's got a V cut in it. You put it down like this, and what this does is this makes it to where you can do work on the hands without getting the uh, paper dial uh, messed up. And now we're going to remove uh, the movement from the uh, from the case. First thing we got to do is remove the gong because the gong is just going to get in our way as we try to uh, get this out. The gong is held in place by a double, double nut system and the reason for the double nut system is you can then focus up or down in very minute adjustments. Uh, uh, the um, the uh, height of the gong. It's all right to use magnetized tools in pendulum clocks because there's no hairspring involved. Uh, you have to make sure your tools are demagnetized when you're dealing with uh, uh, hairsprings. This is a watchmaker's little charm right here. Uh, this is uh, a L old L&R. It's probably about 60 years old. An old L&R uh, demag unit. I can magnetize and demag uh, parts, uh, uh, screwdrivers, stuff like that, and you go in there and you get uh, the screws out. And uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, this is this is how we magnify. I mean, uh, magnetize and demagnetize stuff. You see, this screwdriver now holds that uh, that screw pretty handily. Okay, now you saw me magnetize it. I put it in the in the mag mag machine, push the button, hold it straight. Now I'm going to demag it. I'm going to put it in there, hit the button, and when I hit the button, I'm going to pull it out and wave it as I do, and that changes the lines of flux of the mag uh, the uh, magnetism in the in it, and at that time, it won't pick up anything. Nothing. And you can magnify it again, and voila, it works. So you know that's a little that's a little magic trick that clockmakers do every day. 
Okay, we've removed all four screws in the movement. Now very gently so that you don't bend up the front motion works, you remove the movement out of the case. And uh, you now have the Seth Thomas uh, 89AL movement out of the case. This one's in uh, pretty good shape. It's got an, uh, an uh, it's still uh, uh, goobed up around the pivots and stuff. So we're going to do uh, we're going to do the full service on this and sh and show you step by step how it's done. And now we're going to move over to the other bench, and that is where the disassembly is going to. Uh, happen at. You have to put these standoffs in the movement. What we need to do now is we need to cage the power of the um, mainsprings. You try to take this thing apart even with the mainsprings down as far as they are right now. Uh, and you're going to have uh, a heck of a mess on your hands. So we're going to cage the power on these mainsprings. The way you cage the power on the mainsprings is you have these these uh, these uh, simple round uh, uh, mainspring holders and what they do is you bring the mainspring up, you give the mainspring some power, you wind it up to where you get the radius that, that, uh, that circle you get it in to the size to where you can get the uh, uh, mainspring holder in place. Slip it in. Hold it in place. I should be wearing a pair of gloves. Let's go ahead and do this the right way. And I don't want I don't want to shoot a video of them driving me to the hospital with, to get my hands sewn up. So you get, uh, you get your leather glove on and uh, you, you get this in place and you remove the spring on the click and then at that time you give it a little bit of a back wind and then go forward and you now have entrapped the power of the spring in this spring holder. And you, you can now separate the plates when you do it on both springs you can now separate the plates safely and not have to worry about the clock coming apart. Now we have the movement, uh, we have all the, the power off the movement and we can now shake the main the the uh, uh, gear train and see what it's doing. There are two pivots here that we're going to re-pivot. This one here and this one here. If you look real closely, you can see that pivot is has side shake. It's moving back and forth, and that's just a little bit more than I want to see it doing. This one here, and it's also doing it uh, on the back side. So. Uh, we're going to have to do just a touch of re-pivoting on this. Now what we're going to do is we are going to take the nuts loose on this movement and this is where you know some care needs to be taken because you can always get yourself into a little bit of trouble and uh, bend uh, uh, pivots and that's something that you don't want to do. You don't want to sit there and start um, uh, uh, having to straighten pivots uh, because that's where it gets into a little bit of excitement. So we're going to sit here and take the nuts nuts loose. We have some springs, some brass spring wire that we need to need to move out of the way. Uh, unhook and uh, get this done where we can uh, disassemble. This is for the uh, striker. This is the spring that brings the striker back. 
and then we have a uh, very small uh, uh, brass spring there that holds the uh, the, the the chiming uh, in place. We have one more screw here. That's right. We have the fifth screw. And uh, this little piece right here is where you hang when you're uh, moving the clock. You can hang uh, the pendulum rod uh, uh, on the clock. I'm going to take the pendulum rod out. Uh, it, is, it is usually in a brass uh, usually in a brass uh, post that has a slit in it and we're going to uh, open it up just a touch to where we can get that that spring out go ahead and move the spring out there we go get it in place that's the uh, that's the suspension spring. Uh, this is the suspension spring here, which causes the pendulum to be able to swing back and forth. It's the it's the hinge of it all. And now we have it in place. And there we go. Statement out of the way, and voila, we'll take all this off in, in just a minute. What you do now is you uh, separate the gears to help yourself out. You have two gear trains in the clock. You have the timekeeping side, and you have the, uh, uh, the striking side. This is the escapement wheel, uh, fourth wheel, third wheel, second wheel and then we have the uh, main wheel here that has the spring on it this is uh, this is the guy on an American clock this will turn once in a 24 hour period while up here in the escapement it'll turn once every 45 50 seconds Here's your fly governor. This is the strike side. This is what is striking the clock. Uh, all the wheels. This is your your stop motion works. It uh, gives it gives it the uh, the ability to position itself for warning and then uh, locks in place and then starts chiming uh, 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 when when the clock is designed to chime. Here's your hour arbor and there's your minute arbor. We'll put all that in place and uh, here's your uh, camming for the chimes. We'll go we'll, we'll go okay. from there. Now uh, after another quick inspection of the uh, that was dirty. That was filthy filthy. Um, after another quick inspection uh, now we're going to put this Get this ready. Put this in the ultrasound. Yes, this is real high tech right here. This is the, this is the ultrasound department. Uh, this is a vat of denatured alcohol. This is how you rinse, and uh, uh, the the pieces after they've gone through the ultrasound. The ultrasound is uh, a two and a half gallon ultrasound, and it is filled with. Uh, the cleaning fluid. It is a special secret recipe that's been used for over a hundred years by various watchmakers and I'm not going to go through the 11 different herbs and spices that is in there but uh, it's it's ammonia based so uh, believe me when I tell you when I took the lid off you can tell if you still have ammonia in that or not. Now we're going to um, we're going to uh, uh, this is the basket that, the, that the, the, the clock is going to be put in with. We just actually just stack the plates in place. Here's a, a basket full of the small parts and we have this uh, uh, this uh, little bar here that'll hold uh, the gears in place. Put these, uh, all the uh, camming 
and everything in the small basket. Make sure it gets into the small basket and uh, the escapement. The main wheels and here's the count wheel. Get all that in there. Put that in the put that in the ultrasound. I don't think my camera is going to like this noise. But uh, you put all that into the ultrasound. It's set for about 20 minutes. I don't like to use the heat. Uh, it's not really necessary. And you turn on the ultrasound and voila, starts deep cleaning these parts. Well, now the cleaning cycle is over. The wash cycle is over. And what we do now is we're going to uh, uh, rinse the uh, movement in denatured alcohol. The reason why we use denatured alcohol is that it will remove all the water uh, in all the cracks and crevices uh, in the parts here. This is ammonia based but it's mixed in water. And uh, this will remove the water and also it flashes off at a lower temperature so when we put it in the dryer it will dry faster and uh, with no water residue uh, after it's all over with here. And uh, the dryer is about as cheap as it comes, uh, comes by. It's a box that I built, dr uh, drilled some holes on the side, and uh, put a hair dryer on top. You'd be surprised how many uh, clock shops have just this kind of uh, dryer box because it's quick, it's fast, it doesn't cost a lot of money, keeps your shop expenditures down, and when the dryer gives up, you go to Walmart, buy another one for about 15 bucks, and uh, you're back in business. So, put the movement in the dryer box, uh, latch it up, turn on the dryer, give it about 15 minutes, voila, you've got a clean movement. Okay. We've now completed the drying, and we can start doing a little bit of the polishing of the pivots. And then we're going to do the uh, rebushing work, and then we're going to uh, clean the main springs and start putting this 80-year-old uh, uh, movement back together. Okay, now we've gotten the uh, the movement out of the dryer. We now have a nice, clean movement, and uh, I'm going to show you something here. Uh, this is for you hobbyists out there. That are sitting there going, well, how do I, you know, how do I polish pivots? I don't want to have an outlay of a lot of equipment and stuff. Well, I'm going to show you. If you're taking a course at the NAWCC or uh, 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 you know whether it's a local branch or um, uh, at uh, the at uh, other schools. You can get this. This is a, a penny, uh, uh, it's commonly known as a, uh, I believe they call it a penny lathe. Anyway, what this is, is this is a little uh, hand way of uh, uh, polishing pivots. You have these grooves here in the wood, and uh, it allows you the ability, old school, the way they did it back uh, years and years ago, uh, uh, you have this cord and you go like this and you can you can polish the pivots it's like you like a watch it's based on the same principle as watchmakers using a, a Jacobs lathe uh, uh, these are burnishers uh, you can buy these at uh, time savers merits uh, any of your uh, clock shops, you have left-handed and right-handed, and it's how the uh, edge here is 
uh, uh, set up. And what you do is uh, you put a little bit of oil on it. I'm showing you this for you hobbyists out there that are uh, watching this to get some tips. Uh, and this is how uh, you can polish pivots. And you, you, it's an acquired feel. You don't put that much pressure. This is the, a very fine, shallow uh, file. It's a pivot polisher. And you make sure that you're flat. And as you pull down, you go forward. And then you come back. And you, you, you'll learn this. You're going back and forth. And what you're doing here is you're taking out the grooves and the scores that are in uh, uh, these pivots. Uh, what I'm going to show you now, I'm going to uh, hook up my uh, microscope camera, and I'm going to show you the, uh, uh, the type of scoring and stuff that uh, uh, you have in these and, and what you're trying to accomplish. Let me go ahead and do this one. That way I can show you what the finished product looks like compared to um, uh, what they look like when they come out of the clock. You do this, you use the uh, coarse file first and you get, you get it pretty well polished down. Now, you, uh, this, this looks like smooth metal, but this has been charged on a uh, stone to give it a very, very slight abrasive feel to it. Put just a touch of oil on it. And what we're going to do here is get that mirror finish. And you know, you're not really taking all that, you're actually polishing here. You're not taking that much metal off. And you, the, uh, the pivot still stays parallel. You want to inspect it, you know, kind of closely before you start doing this to make sure that you have a pivot uh, that is in pretty good condition. These are if you have this form, you either have to try to dress it up on the lathe or go ahead and uh, cut it off, center drill, and try to replace the pivot. On the um, on the clock, that's that one side there. We're going, and then you use. Let me get. Let me get it here. You have to have a little bit of what's called. Pith wood, P I T H, uh, and what you do with that is you uh, you clean uh, the pivot, and you get rid of. Uh, it's a very very soft, corky type wood, and you clean the shoulder and the uh, the pivot, and you uh, then do the nail test. Make sure that you've gotten. Uh, all the scoring out of there and uh, do the nail test that feels real smooth right there let me get the microscope out and I'll show you what a pivot looks like before it's dressed up and then what it looks like afterwards and then we're then uh, off camera I won't bore you with it but I'm going to do all the pivots on this clock and then we're going to do the bushing work Okay, under magnification, you can see this is the uh, pivot the way it looks like when it just comes out of the clock. Real dirty. Uh, you see a lot of scoring. Uh, rings. You've, you've got rings cut into the metal. All this needs to be smoothed out. You have burrs that is on the shoulder and on the, uh, up on the uh, uh, arbor. This is, you know, this isn't good. This will rob power from your clock, cause it to stop. And this is the pivot that you saw me uh, cleaning on the uh, penny lathe. And see how smooth the metal is? It's just a mirror finish there. Mirror finish and the shoulder is all smoothed out. That's the way a pivot should look like after you're all through with the uh, uh, polishing. 
that's going to be a smooth running gear. Okay, now, if you have, if you take your clock, if you're not one of the hobbyists or enthusiasts and you actually take your clock to a clock shop, this is probably the way that the horologist is going to polish the pivots. This is a 8 millimeter uh, lathe. Uh, this is standard equipment in any watch or clock shop. You can do a great many things with it and this is how I quickly and very uh, this is how I quickly uh, do um, pivots on a clock and takes a lot of the time out of the polishing Spin it around. in a little bit worse shape than a lot of them on this clock. Uh, there we go. Now, remember we're going to do a little bit of bushing work. I've already done a little bit of setup here. Uh, this is our bushing machine, and as you can, and this is um, this is your alignment tool. And you align the hole. You want to have a precision uh, placement. Uh, if you get, uh, if you drill off on a bushing, you can bind the wheels in a clock so this is very precise work if you don't get it right you have to do some depthing sometimes you have to do depthing just because of the way the clock was set up or, or from an old repair so you make sure that you're in line with the proper uh, alignment of the hole and you uh, tighten your clamping down then you get your reamer, your cutter. We're going in with 3.5 uh, size bushings. And here's what we're going to be putting into the plate. And I'm going to show you how we do that real quick. Now we're going to sit here and we're going to ream out the hole. Then we're going to uh, take the ragged edge off. Then Now these bushings, they have an oil sink on them. 
So we got to make the, sure the oil sink is pointing in the proper direction. Make sure that we get the bushing in place. And then make sure that we are flush with the plate where we got enough in shake. Voila. That's how you do bushings uh, on a clock. Then we're going to uh, ream out the hole, get the proper uh, get the proper side shake. Looks pretty nice. Okay, now we have the wheel that belongs in that hole and the plate. Now you see it's just too small. It's not going to fit in. So what we're going to have to do is uh, ream out the hole to the proper size. And of course, I would pick the one that doesn't work right. And what we're doing here is we're burnishing the hole, we're enlarging the hole, and you got to make sure that you have your axis right. You have to drill it, you're, you're, uh, when you're burnishing it, you have to make sure that you are straight and true in all directions. And what you want is you want a little bit of wobble you want, when it's all set up right, you want about five degrees, five to ten degrees of wobble in the um, in the bushing and what that does is that gives it enough tolerance to where it won't bind that's about what you want right there. See how I can rock it in the hole? Okay, that is what we're looking for. Now we're going to uh, broach it. We're going to smooth broach it. I was calling it burnishing. My mistake, it's actually broaching. And we're going to smooth broach it make sure we get all the cut lines out and everything. Just a touch of oil. There's actually no cutters on this. This is like honing a knife. It's almost like a stone. And it smooths the... Uh, and it will smooth the brass to where there's no leading edges or anything. Then uh, we'll go ahead and Make sure that we have that edge off of it. And then we'll put the plates together and do what's called a spin test. And what that spin test does is it'll tell us if we have any bad places in the setup. If it's too tight, uh, if we have a, a burr or something. And what we want, uh, what we want to see is uh, a nice spin, no matter how we hold. the uh, movement. There's nothing that's going to drag it down or slow it down or bring it to a stop. Just like that. That's nice. 
That's the way we do it there. Make sure that we're spinning. You also feel for slight vibration. Right side up, upside down. That's good. And that's how you replace the bushing. That bushing right there. That's the one we replaced. Now we're going to bush the rest of it out. Do a final, um, uh, do a real quick ultrasound clean on the, um, on the gears and the plates to uh, make sure that we have no filings or anything. And then we're going to start putting the, um, the clock back together. We're going to clean up the springs. I'll show you how we clean up the springs. And um, uh, then we'll put the clock back and now together. comes the moment in time that every clock maker really doesn't look forward to. We're going to put the pin back in the grenade. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to uh, re remove the tension and the pressure and um, we're going to um, uh, clean these mainsprings. You have to take them down completely. Let me move some of this stuff around to where you can get a full view. The uh, This is very, very uh, not, well, this is very, very uh, tense work because you are messing with the power of the spring and you are literally taking all the safeties off and uh, making it to where the spring is actually very light. You have to take all the pressure off the spring, unwind it out, check the condition of the spring and see how bad it is. This spring this spring looks like that it's worn out. This looks like a worn out mainspring. I have to get it completely out of the arbor to make sure lay it down here. Yep. That's what's called a set mainspring. And the way you can tell that is <clears throat> you look at the way it's looping and it should be a full, you know, a very nice looking Archimedes coil. Well you see one, two, three coils that are pretty well uh, spaced out the way they should be and then the spring tightens up uh, after that. This causes a clock to run fine for two, three days and then it just falls on its face. It starts losing all its power. It starts losing time. It gets lethargic. Uh, the net, One day it uh, loses one minute the next day it loses four minutes. The next day, if it's still running, it'll lose eight minutes or uh, half a minute uh, one day and three minutes the next day. The clock all of a sudden just starts losing time. And there's no way to resurrect one of these, no real good way. In, uh, in fact, in every technical book that I have, it says you can't do it. So we're going to replace the mainspring which uh, is fine by, by me because the cost of the spring, uh, it's, e it's really easier to replace the mainspring than it is to clean one uh, because of the time involved cleaning one. So we're going to replace the springs on this and now we're going to move on to uh, reassembly and we'll go from there. Okay, now we start reassembling 
the clock and uh, I always put a mark on the um, uh, on the count wheel uh, that way you don't accidentally put it in upside down if you do uh, it'll chime 12 right but at 11 but at one o'clock it chimes 11 and at two o'clock it chimes 10 and the, that makes the uh, clock guy very upset because he's got to <laughs> take everything back apart and get the uh, uh, clock back into uh, proper uh, assembly. Uh, we're going to put the staunchings on it now. And everything on these American clocks, they're really uh, uh, pretty simple. Everything just pretty much falls right into place. Uh, they're wonderful pieces of uh, uh, ingenuity. Uh, German clocks, boy, those are uh, those are well precision pieces of equipment, and they um, they uh, can sometimes be a little difficult in the uh, uh, reassembly. Okay. Uh, it's pretty uh, in, intense movement and watching uh, when you're getting the uh, movement back together. So we'll do that off camera. Uh, one thing you want to look at is the pallets of this clock. Make sure that they're, uh, they have a mirror finish on them. Like I said, this is an old restore and they're in pretty good shape, so I'm going to leave them alone. We've done all the magic, getting all the pivots and everything in place, and now we do a couple of little tests to make sure that Everything is in good shape. Put a little bit of a wind on it on the strike side and make sure that all that camming is lined up. Yes. All right. Now, now we get the springs in place. Now we come to the oiling of the clock. Use, because of the different loads in the clock, I use two different types of oils. The only part that really gets oiled is the pivots. Uh, you don't want to get on the lobes of the gears strictly for the reason that will cause them to wear out in just a matter, matter of a few short years. Touch there, the escapement, put just a touch on in between the hour and the minute arbor, cavitation will bring it down. And now you oil the escapement, just a touch of oil. Voila, now we're ready to test on the test stand our clock. All right, movement has been fully assembled. 
it has been regulated uh, it has been oiled uh, it is now put on the test stand minor adjustments done to it it uh, uh, runs a different power tests for five days to watch its performance it's regulated out and uh, now you have a repaired full service movement now after everything has been lined up and checked out and all the the bug shaped out of it you then case the movement back into the clock and there you go a nice freshly fully serviced antique Napoleon mantel clock customer is going to be very happy and like I said all this repair that you saw today this is a full service on a clock. Not vast majority of the vast majority of the time. This is all that needs to be done to Great Grandma McCants' clock or the clock that you bought at the uh, at the estate sale. You know, don't be scared if you see a broken spring inside or it doesn't tick or the pendulum only moves for you know a few seconds and stops. These things are robust built they're like tanks they just get dirty they just get some wear a little bit of bushing work some fresh mainsprings a good thorough cleaning and your clock is back up and running giving you years and years and years of service and a uh, a family heirloom that could be cherished for decades